and greetings friends. Today I want to talk to you about 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 6 through about 16. Now according to mainstream fundamentalist preachers, these scriptures are supposed to prove that God's law is done away. Is that true? Is that what these scriptures are telling us? You know, it's amazing to me how these people come up with a list of proof texts on why they shouldn't keep God's law. They come up with lists, like I showed you before, the Bible.ca. They come up with lists on why we shouldn't keep the Sabbath day, and that's the commandment they have a problem with. They don't have a list of, of proof texts showing you we shouldn't keep, uh, you shall not commit adultery, or obeying your parents, or taking God's name in vain. They don't have a list of those, but they do have a list on why we shouldn't keep the Sabbath day. And they come up with a lot of excuses. The Sabbath is just for Israel. And I did a, I did a Bible misconception video on that. Is the Sabbath just for Israel? And also there's an article on our website called, Did the Nations of Noah Keep God's Law? And I'll put the link in the description below to show you that the nations of Noah did keep God's law, including the Sabbath day. And I also have another book called The Sabbath in Genesis that you could download free of charge off our website, BritishIsrael.ca, to show you that the nations that came out of Noah's seed did keep the law of God. So it wasn't just for Israel. But these are the excuses people come up with so they don't have to keep the Sabbath day. And I don't understand why. I mean, what is wrong with the Sabbath day? The Bible plainly says that the Sabbath day is a day of joy. It's a day of rest, and we... All need that, especially in this sin-sick world that we live in. We need rest from our burdens, a time of assembly with the brothers and sisters of Christ, a time of learning and teaching and preaching the law of God. I think, mean, what's the problem with the Sabbath day? I just don't understand. But they come up with lists of excuses on why we shouldn't keep the Sabbath, and therefore God's law is done away. And this scripture here, these scriptures here, are... Again, more proof texts that they use to try and prove that God's law is done away. Well, is it done away? Well, let's go through it from the Bible. In verse 6, it starts off, it says, Who, talking about God, also have made us able ministers of the New Testament. Now, what is the New Testament? Read Jeremiah 31, 31, Hebrews the 8th chapter. It says that God will write his laws in the, in the tables, fleshly tables of our hearts. And in their minds will I write them, the Bible says. So they are ministers of the new covenant, which of course consists of the law of God. So they are ministering, administering the laws of God. Now it says, not of the letter. Now I went through another Bible misconception program to show you that those that the letter of the law is not in the Bible. And when it says the letter, it means people who are Israelites in name only but doth transgress the law, as it says in Romans 2, verse 27, that those who are of the letter are Israelites in name, in appearance, in race. They are also circumcised, but they transgress the law. So they are Israelites in name only. But of the Spirit, people in the church of God have the Holy Spirit in them, as it says in Romans, the eighth chapter. And the Bible plainly says that the love of God is written on the tables of our hearts, Romans, the fifth chapter. And what is the love of God? In 1 John, it says the love of God is keeping his commandments. So they are ministers, not of the letter, but of the spirit, the church of God, spirit-filled people. For the letter killeth. And as I said, people of the letter who are in name only, they transgress the law. And of course, the wages of sin is death. The letter killeth. Now it says here, but the Spirit giveth life, as the Bible plainly says, that those that keep the laws of God shall inherit eternal life, as Jesus Christ plainly says in Matthew, the 19th chapter, that if those who keep the commandments of God shall receive eternal life. Now notice, but if the ministration of death, now this is of course talking about the administration of Moses. It's not talking about the law, but the administering of the law, how the law was administered in the days of Moses. It says, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, and this is why God wrote the Ten Commandments on stones, it was a symbol of the hearts of the Israelites. They did not want to obey. They didn't want to receive the Holy Spirit. So it was a symbol of their 
of their stony hearts, their hard heartedness. So it was written on graven on stones was glorious. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. So it's talking about God's glory shining off of Moses. This is what was glorious about this administration, that it came from God. And Moses was a representative of God. So God's light sh shone from the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which, and countenance means his presence, which, now glory is italicized and not in the, oris in the original, so it should read, which was to be done away. His presence was to be done away, taken away. And when did that happen? At the death of Moses. So it's not talking anything about the law. It's talking about Moses and his presence was done away when he died. Verse 8, it says, How shall not the ministration of spirit be rather glorious or more glorious? Because Moses had to deal with fleshly people who were not converted. But the ministration of the New Testament is more glorious because the people in the church of God have the Holy Spirit. God's law is written on their hearts and they are obedient. Notice verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory. Now why is it called the ministration of condemnation or the ministration of death? Well, because Moses was made a judge to Israel. And the Bible plainly says, and I've gone through I've gone through this with you in another Bible misconception program about the eye for an eye law. Did Jesus contradict the eye for an eye law? And we show you that Jesus did not contradict the eye for an eye law, that only the government can put people to death. The judges in Israel were called, were of course the government in Israel, and God allowed them to administer the death penalty for those who sin willfully. It was only those who sinned willfully that were put to death. There were sacrifices for people who sinned in ignorance. And when those sacrifices were uh, offered to God, their sins were cleansed. It was only for them who sinned willfully, as it says here in Numbers. Let me just go to it right quickly. Numbers, the 15th chapter. Numbers 15, verse 30. And it plainly says this. One second here. Numbers 15, 30. It says, But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously or willfully, and that means with a hostile spirit, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproaches the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people, meaning being put to death, because he has despised the word of the eternal and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall be utterly cut off, his iniquity, his iniquity shall be upon him. So when people sinned in the nation of Israel, the government had every right, if they sinned willfully, the government had every right to put them to death. And in the New Testament, Jesus Christ said that we should follow those laws that the people in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, the people that are ruling over Israel sit in Moses' seat, and he said to obey those laws. So this ministration of condemnation means that it was how the law was administered and those that broke the law willfully were put to death. And that's why it's called the ministration of condemnation. Be glory came from God. G uh, Moses had the glory of God. Much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Now, nowhere does it say in the Bible that Moses' administration was not an administration of righteousness. Instead, the Bible plainly says that it was a ministry of righteousness, as it says in Romans, the 10th chapter. In Roman, Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 5. I'll go there right quickly. Romans 10, verse 5. And it plainly says this. This is what Moses said. For Moses describeth the righteousness of the law. And what is righteousness? Psalm 1, 119, 172. All your commandments are righteousness. He describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them, or in them, as it should say. So Moses' administration, they taught the righteousness of the law. They taught to keep God's laws. And you see that all over the Torah. Moses continually told the Israelites to keep the law of God. And in 
Second Chronicles, the 35th chapter. The Levites taught the law of God, as it says here in Second Chronicles, the 35th chapter, verse 3, it says, And said unto the Levites that taught all Israel. And what do they teach Israel? The knowledge of Almighty God. Second Chronicles, the 30th chapter, verse 22. It says, And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And you also read that in the book of Malachi. The Levites, the ministration of Moses taught the law of God. It was a ministry of righteousness, but it was also a ministry of condemnation because they were judges in Israel and they were allowed to put people to death. Only the government is allowed to administer the death penalty for sin. Now, the church of God doesn't have that power yet. But in the kingdom of God, it plainly says that we shall be kings and priests, priests, and they shall administer the laws of God. And that includes administering the death penalty for people who sin willfully. That will come in the future for the church of God. So it says here, verse 9, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Because... Moses had to deal with fleshly, unconverted people, where the ministry of righteousness of the Church of God deals with people who have the Holy Spirit of God and are converted. That's the difference, why it exceeds in glory. And then it says, For even that which was made glorious, talking about the ministration of Moses, had no glory in this respect, these people were not filled with the Holy Spirit, by reason of the glory that excelleth. And that's, of course, Jesus which abides with his church forever, where Moses, he died and doesn't abide with Israel forever. So that is why it excels as, as well. Verse 11, for if that which is done away was glorious, what was done away? Well, we read it up here in verse seven, the glory of Moses, it was done away when he died. And so Moses is gone, and that glory is gone. That which is done away was glorious. Much more, that which remaineth is glorious. Talking about the ministration of Moses, what remains today is still glorious because they follow the laws of God. And that ministration is still here today, administering judgment and justice in the earth. And it will continue in the kingdom of God when the church of God when the church of God become kings and priests and administer the laws of God all over the world. Verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. What was abolished? His glory when he died. And he put a veil over his face so they didn't see the light of Almighty God. And that light represented the truth of Almighty God. It was covered so they didn't see it. Then it says, verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth that same veil untaken in the reading of the Old Testament. They just, they can't see the truth. They still have that veil that they cannot see the truth of Almighty God, God as it says here in 2 Corinthians 4th chapter verse 6, For God, who commandeth the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, that's the Holy Spirit, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have the face of Moses, which is now done away, gone, because he died. And now we have the face of Jesus Christ. And his light shines in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and we have the knowledge of Almighty God. So that same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. That covering is gone, and we can now see the truth, the light of Almighty God. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, that veil is upon their heart. They just can't see the truth. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, that veil is done away away. When they convert to Jesus Christ, that veil is done away, and they see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So to say, I mean, here, there's nowhere here in the Bible that says that God's law is done away. It talks about how it was administered, 
that the glory of Moses is done away because of his death, but there is nothing here that says that God's law is done away. So to say that using these scriptures is a very large biblical misconception.